good morning and welcome to Resurrection Church. Uh, my name is Emma Pombach and I'm really excited to be here with you today. As I was driving into church today, I was listening to one of my favorite worship songs, which is How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And what I love about that song is it reminds me of what is at the core of the gospel. And that is that God loves us and that he loves us so much that he came down and died for us when we were unlovable. When we were far from him, God came close to us. And that is a love that we can't even possibly imagine. And my prayer for us today is that we would have the Holy Spirit come to us in such a way that we can even begin to understand the depth and the breadth and the height of the love of God that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. And my favorite verse from that song is the one that says, I will not boast in anything, not gifts, nor power, nor wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. So would you stand with me today as we boast in our Lord and Savior and the love he has for us? God, we live 
gospel truth of old shall not kneel and it shall not faint. It will never, it will never lose its strength. It will never lose its relevance. Man, what a peace to know that, uh, and a peace to have a firm foundation. Man, whew. Well, I'm really excited for you guys to hear this message. So find someone you haven't seen in a while, you're excited to see, shake their hand or give them a hug. We'll be back in a few. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? I heard a woo and okay. This is awesome. My name's Pastor Mark. I'm one of the lead pastors around here. And we are so pleased that you're here today. Seriously, very pleased. We are a church that uh, we want the people that come to our church to be known. We want to know you and we want you to know others. And one of the ways we want to do that is by when new guests come, we would love for you guys to fill out these I'm new here cards. It's a way that we can connect with you guys. It's a way you can connect with us and we can discuss how we can better minister together and meet the needs that you guys may have. So if you are a guest or you've never filled out one of these cards before, we would love for you to take a second, fill it out. And at the end of the service, you can put it in the offering boxes. If you're online, we very much want to know you also. And on the chat, there should be a, a button to push that, that says, I'm new here also. And we would love for you guys to be able to uh, fill, that out, fill that out also. In the pew in front of you, you'll also find this, I need prayer. So if you need prayer, um, we would love to be able to pray for you and to lift you up to the Father on high uh, for your prayer request. So you can fill that out. And at the end of the service, you can put that in the offering boxes too. So the one big thing that I have for you guys today is awesome. There's no doubt about it. It's absolutely amazing. And I am jacked up for this. So (laughs) watch this beautiful barbecue footage. First, we are going to have an Easter barbecue. So what's happening at this barbecue? Well, we're going to have an egg hunt from toddlers to sixth grade. A barbecue, which includes uh, hot dogs, drinks, ice cream, and then we're going to ask you to potluck the rest of it. What time is it happening? It's starting at 11. I think 11. 11 o'clock. 11 (laughs) o'clock. And it's going to be over around 1230, but if you stay a little bit later, that's okay. All right, so where is it happening? It is happening at Res Kids Park. And just because it's going to be sunny outside, don't forget to bring your chairs and umbrellas. All right. So, you know what's great about this event is that you can invite your friends, your families, and your neighbors. And your neighbors. So, we hope to see you there on April 1st. Bye. Bye. Did you guys catch it? There's going to be a potluck. (laughs) What was that? Deviled eggs? Deviled eggs. But uh, what I discovered at the last potluck is, is the deviled eggs are very lonely unless they have some sort of cornbread product to, to accompany it, like, you know, cornbread casserole, jalapeno cheddar cornbread, woo! Yeah. So we, <laughs> we would love for you guys to come. We have these invest invite cards in the lobby. So we would absolutely love for you guys to grab a handful of these, take it, invite your friends, invite your family, invite your neighbors. Uh, invite the person on the 99 that just cuts you off. Uh, invite everybody to come to this event and just chill and have a great time with us. We very much are looking forward to that. Uh, I'm going to say a prayer and then we're going to continue on with our service. 
Father God, Lord, we thank you for this day, God. We thank you for your church and the ability to gather and to worship you today, God, together, Lord. God, I ask you to be with us today as uh, we are going to hear your word, God. I ask you to soften our hearts, to open our ears, to hear the truth about you, God. We ask you to be with Pastor Daniel today as he's going to come up and preach your word, God. We ask that uh, your words flow freely from his lips, God. Um, Lord, we are just excited for what you're about to do today. We are excited for your church, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My name is Pastor Daniel. I'm one of the lead pastors here. Um, that was footage actually from a revival that has been taking place in Asbury, Kentucky for a few weeks now. It started after just a normal chapel service that they have on campus once a week, and it has uh, it lasted weeks. And they finally had to send kids back to class because they had been worshiping. It had been 24 hours a day for weeks of worship and praise. And then that spread to other campuses around the country. And so if you've not heard that story, gotten to read some about it, uh, I would encourage you. It is, it is a very encouraging story about how God is on the move um, in uh, different parts of our country. And, and actually, God is on the move in different parts of the world all around us all the time. I want to read you a quick missions update from the garrisons in Southeast Asia. Uh, this is actually just one of the updates on the missions update that we email out about every six weeks or so of different missions partners, uh, ministries, and missionaries that are all at work around our country. It says this, uh, Fulmea, which is a lady's name, pictured in, in the email is a 41-year-old woman who is having a big impact for Jesus in her village. Like many village women, her life before Christ was hardly worth living. She suffered from a particularly difficult allergy for many years. Her husband was a drunkard. They have a severe financial problems, and there was no peace in their house. One day, one of the church planters shared the good news of Jesus Christ with her. She was hesitant to respond at first, but because she was desperate for a change in her life, she came to believe this new God may in fact be a God of miracles and ultimately chose to trust Jesus with her life and soul. Her family was angry with her, and there was even more strife in her home for a time. But a few months later, she was healed of her allergy. When the family saw her healing and her transformed life, they all chose to follow Jesus as well. Now there are over 30 people meeting at her house, all believers in Jesus. That's encouraging. I want you to be encouraged. Um, one, of the, one of the particular ways uh, that uh, I am stirred up towards good works, that, that stirs my affections toward Jesus, is getting to hear the testimonies of what God is doing in other people's lives. And so if you're not uh, signed up to get our church emails, if you're not getting the missions update emails and the other emails, I would encourage you, fill out one of those I'm new here cards, uh, put your email address on there, and in the comments should be like, I need the emails, and just drop them off in uh, the offering baskets on the way out on those boxes, and we will get you signed up for that uh, because stories like this are not unique. They're actually happening all over the world as God is on the move in different places, not just Bakersfield, but all over the country and the world. Um, we are in a series called The Romans Road. So The Romans Road is five verses in Romans that is uh, one of the most simplistic ways to follow the story arc of the Bible, to, to kind of look at the uh, explanation of the gospel message, what salvation is for men and women. And it, it is a mechanism that has been used over the last few decades to, to simplify and explain the gospel message to someone else. So if you're not really sure where to start, you can use The Romans Road and it takes you through these simple five verses that explain the problem and the solution of the gospel. And so we're in week four. In week one, uh, we talked about the situation. The situation's explained in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the problem. And that's you and I and our problem. It's a problem of humanity. In week two, we talked about the hope. And Pastor Mark preached on Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then last week, Pastor Vance preached on the, the explanation of, of how it, and that's Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
And today, in sort of chapter 4 of the Romans Road, we're going to look at Romans 10, 9. Uh, and Romans 10, this section, is uh, what Charles Spurgeon would call the machinery of the gospel, the, the how-to. And we're going to end up answering primarily this question, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Uh, there's a bit of a controversy in, in Christian circles and has been for centuries now about whether or not uh, God chose us to be saved before the foundations of the earth or whether or not we chose God. And, and, and that, that theological debate that has raged for centuries is essentially called predestination versus free will. And in different evangelical camps, you've had a lot of argument about which of these is true. Um, but let me read you an interesting story that I read recently. I think uh, it'll shed a little bit of light on this. For centuries, philosophers and scientists argued over the nature of light. Some claimed that light behaves like a wave traveling through space, uh, much like sound. Others disagreed, stating that light is a stream of tiny particles emanating from its source. And unfortunately, experimentation didn't help because when it's tested as a wave, light proves to be a wave. And when it's tested as a particle, light proves to be a particle. And as people who understand such things have explained, uh, one experiment should disprove the other, and yet experiments don't lie. The debate has divided the world's most brilliant minds into opposing camps. Each experimenting, calculating, theorizing, and writing to prove the other wrong. Then, in 1905, uh, there was a scholastic undesirable, a, a relative unknown who worked as a patent examiner during the day and spent his nights trying to unravel the great mysteries of physics. He published an article in Germany's leading physics journal that would change everything. This relatively unknown man named Albert Einstein put forward the idea that light is both a wave and a particle. His theory made no sense at all, yet his calculations satisfactorily answered every objective. Objection. As scientific laymen, we can barely appreciate the effect his idea had on the world. His theory, which eventually won him a Nobel Prize, defies the laws of physics as we understand them. This dual nature of light should not be possible, yet somehow, in a dimension beyond our intellectual capacity, the mystery of light is as simple as two plus two. The world of theology has its unsolvable puzzles as well. How can God be one, yet three, yet one? We really can't comprehend it. Nevertheless, the Bible clearly presents him as a tri-unity. It is a paradox that threatened to divide the Christian world soon after the apostles died, simply because many teachers preferred a deity that they could comprehend. Many of those early heresies exist now as cults, which cleverly disguise themselves to appear authentically Christian. Today, we'll dive into this question, what must I do to be saved? And yet, the Bible clearly states, even in the book of Romans that we're going to read from, that God has predestined those whom he will save. So how can God know and have chosen all who will come to saving faith before the foundations of the earth, and yet it also be up to us to choose God or to say yes to God? Are, are, we, are we robots only doing what we were designed to do? Do we even have free will? What is the answer? And so we'll answer this question First, before we move to the next, did God choose us or did we choose him? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Did God choose us or did we choose him? Yes. God clearly chose you before the foundation of the earth. That's in Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. He predestined us to become sons and daughters of the king. And yet today, we will talk about the specific action that you and I must take to be saved. It's a paradox. There's plenty to say about this paradox and these theologies, plenty to learn, plenty of mysteries to unravel, plenty of experts that will tell you that they have completely figured it out. And in my opinion, plenty of mystery left to be revealed someday in heaven. So is it us choosing God or is it God choosing us? Yes. Secondly, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Here's what Romans 10, 9 says. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Confess 
and believe. That seems so simple. Confess and believe. That's it, guys. Thanks for coming to church today. If you drop your cards off in... (laughs) It seems so simple. Say it out loud. Confess it. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he's the Lord. Believe that he was raised from the dead and you will be saved. And on the surface, I think it is sometimes that simple, a childlike faith, and yet I believe there are just layers to this. And I, and I want to explain this to you. See, uh, the primary uh, objection that, that Jesus got in his three years of ministry when he was walking around this New Testament world and he was proclaiming the kingdom of God was coming and he was, he was calling people to repentance and he was calling people to himself, the primary pushback that he got was from very religious people, the Pharisees who did not believe that he was the son of God. In fact, uh, we see this in John 5, 16 through 18, when Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath. That's not the real objection that they have to Jesus. It says, and this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. Verse 18, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The Pharisees didn't believe. Jesus faces unbelief uh, from others. Uh, He'll face unbelief when he goes to his hometown. And it says that he 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 couldn't do healing and miracles and things like that in his hometown because of the unbelief there. And you'll see him rebuke his own disciples for unbelief. And so, so certainly there is an unbelief that Jesus has to push against. But that's not really what scares me. What what, what really scares me and and has scared me is when I get to the stories in the Bible where it says that the demons recognize Jesus as the Son of God and they say it out loud. Why does that scare me? Well, wait a minute. If confess and believe just means to to believe that he's the Son of God and to say it out loud and, and, and the demons do that and they're not saved... Is it more than that? What does confess and believe entail if if the demons are going to do those very things and not be saved? And wait a minute, if if, if that's the case, then how many of you and I who who simply say it out loud and believe, yeah, he's probably the son of God, are simply not saved, but, but practicing what would essentially be the faith of demons? In Mark 5, 1 through 9, we see one of these stories. It says, They, this is Jesus and the disciples, came to the other side of the sea, to the country of Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I assure you by God, do not torment me, For he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. Demons recognized Jesus as the son of God. They believed Jesus was the son of God. They said it out loud. They declared this out of their mouth. This is pre-cross. Our our verse says that you have to also believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. You turn to Acts 19, and we see another demon-possessed man in Acts 19. And and there's some exorcists trying to throw him out, and they use the name of Jesus, and he replies to them. This is post-resurrection. And he says, Jesus, I know. Jesus, I know. Well, how can... How can demons speak that Jesus is the Son of God and know that he was alive after the crucifixion and not be saved? What does confess with your mouth and believe in your heart really mean if the demons do those things? It has to be more than simply the the literal translation of these words or else we have a significant paradox here. I had a very interesting interesting conversation with a a guy that's a a friend of mine. Uh, He lives pretty far away, and, and we talk a lot uh, online. And, and we were chatting, and uh, he used a phrase that someone else had used in the last couple of weeks, and it really stood out to me. Um, he said, Daniel, I'm a God-fearing man. 
Has anyone ever heard that phrase, I'm a God-fearing man? God-fearing woman? I'm a God-fearing man. Now, here's the interesting part of that. Um, This guy's name is Alex, my my buddy. Uh, Alex, who is a God-fearing man, lives an intensely secular lifestyle. He lives by his own entirely subjective moral code. He does whatever he wants, when he wants, and he is the master of his own life. Uh, He would call himself uh, spiritual but not religious. Um, He believes there's some sort of God out there, but maybe he's a little fuzzy on the details. Do you know anyone like this? Have you ever met anyone? There's probably a God. Maybe I'm just a little fuzzy on the details, but I'm a God-fearing man. No? Yes? Maybe? God-fearing. God-fearing implies reverence toward God. If you feared God, you would thus be motivated not to offend him. You'd be motivated to obey him. You'd be motivated to seek him. You'd be motivated to please him. You'd be motivated to figure out what it would take to please him. But in reality, the majority of the population in the Western Hemisphere believes there's a God. Did you know that? The majority of people in the Western, all of Western Europe, all of America, all of our continent, all of North and South America, the majority of us believe there's a God. We're just a little fuzzy on the details. That's not God-fearing. I'm not even sure that's God-acknowledging. The reason that the majority of the Western population believes in this loose concept of a God is because in actuality, atheism is incredibly difficult to find intellectually consistent. Atheism actually doesn't line up with science very well at all. The the majority, over 80% of all astrophysicists believe there's a God. Do you know why? Because they've studied the science. And if you look at the science of the creation of the universe, if you've looked at the idea of the Big Bang Theory, if you've looked at any of these ideas, you realize something started this that was far more powerful than anything that we understand. So intellectually, if you actually study, you're going to go, man, there's, there's, there's probably a God. The, the problem with the idea that there's probably a God is, is that most people believe in a God of their own creation. Most people believe in a God of their own creation that they've sort of thrown together from from personal influence, uh, from the way they were raised, from cultural pressures and life experience. And and, and the gods that most of us create in our own head kind of fall into one of two categories. Either uh, it's a God that is sort of above the idea of of good and and bad, of, of good and evil. It's above that, like like, like good and evil, right and wrong, or sort of human creations, and and God is sort of uh, above that, almost almost like mm, I can't even be be uh, 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 you know that's not that, that's a human thing, and I'm I'm elevated above, and so you guys figure out right and wrong, and I'm just sort of out here. Or it's a God that definitely cares about good and evil. He loves righteousness and he hates hatred, and he has definitive standards that he wants us to adhere to. But you see, if you believe in that kind of God, it gets really sticky all of a sudden. Because you'd have to figure out what that is. C.S. Lewis uh, was an atheist who came to faith simply by logic and reasoning. Now, we know also that God obviously stirred some things in his heart. But, but, but he came at, uh, from atheism into Christianity by thinking about the problem and the situation and observing humanity and our inconsistencies. And he talked about that. Winston Churchill, during World War II, invited him to get on the radio once a week. And, and, and remember the context of when this is happening. He's on the radio during World War II when Nazi Germany is bombing London. And he's explaining, just talking through how rationally he came from atheism to a belief in a creator and the idea that then a creator had to have a, a moral objective standard, not a subjective standard, because it didn't make any sense to have a subject. And he walks through this. They took those radio shows and they turned them into a book. And that book is called Mere Christianity. It's one of the most powerful books you'll ever read. Because it's simply a man who did not believe in God, sitting, observing humanity and going, it's impossible for there not to be a God. And in, in chapters two and three, he talks about the gods of our own creation. How we as humans love to create our own God. Do you know why we love to create our own God? Here's why. When I create my own God, it's amazing how he's really okay with the way that I'm living. Like when I create my own God, my own God is really, he's like, Daniel, you got it all together. You're not doing great, but you're doing okay. It's everybody else that's a problem. No? No one else has done that? Okay, you liars. 
when we create our own God, it is incredibly coincidence that the God we create is generally pretty okay with us and everybody else is the problem. The moral subjectivity of our God always tends to favor us. Now, if we were being really, really, really honest, and C.S. Lewis actually addresses this at some point in the book too, if we're being really, really, really honest, even our own moral subjectivity of the standards that we've created that we say is right and wrong, that we say is the way we should live by, we actually don't even live up to those. We're so inconsistent, we can't even live up to our own subjective morality. But like, like, let's just not talk about that right now and just to sweep that under the rug. The problem of humanity is we love to create our own gods. It's what's at the heart of idolatry. It's why it's the second commandment. Therefore, when we create our own gods, it's not a god to be feared because we've created them to be something that approves of us. So we don't need to do anything different than we're doing today to be right with him because we created a God that's saying, hey, Daniel, you're doing okay. Just keep it up, buddy, and hang in there. So when most people use the term God-fearing with me, this is what they mean. When they say God-fearing, they don't mean they fear God. They don't mean they revere God. They don't mean that they, they, they understand how holy a holy God is. They're saying, I believe there is such a thing as a God, and he's okay with me. So when people say to me, I'm a God-fearing man, I'm a God-fearing woman, I want to answer back with a quote from one of the most famous ancient philosophers, the Princess Bride. <laughs> I do not think that word means what you think it means. I do not think that word means what you think it means. Because to even have a glimpse of God, to even have just a, a small sample of his power, again and again and again, we see stories when that happens. And you turn to the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah gets a glimpse of heaven, of what a holy, righteous God would look like. And the only appropriate response is to fall on his face and say, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. To even get the smallest sample of a holy God is to realize how unholy we are. To realize how not okay he is with me and you. And how far the gap is between his righteousness and ours. That is to be a God-fearing man or a God-fearing woman. And everything else is idolatry and pride and self-righteousness. At the root, so, so, so why are we talking about God-fearing man? Why, what does that have to do with Romans 10.9? Because at the root of the terms that are used here in Romans 10.9, at the root of the word confess, and at the root of the term believe, there is an implication of more than just the English translation of these words. There is an implication in the midst of these two terms that actually puts a, 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 a focus back on actually the idea that should be behind God-fearing, the idea behind reverence, the idea behind repentance, the idea behind surrender are all implied inside these terms. The word confess that's used in Greek in Romans 10.9 is homologous. Jesus. And homologesis, when it's translated in every translation, in ESV and NIV and KGV, it doesn't matter. You can go through BibleGateway.com and you can click on every single translation. And that, that Greek word is confess. It's not state. It's not say. It's not scream. It's not yell. It's not write. It's not claim. It's not proclaim. It's confess. What's the difference between confess and all of those other English words? Why is it always translated as Confess. Because it implies repentance and an acknowledgement of God's authority. Confess, for it to be confess, implies repentance. That is a turning away. And an acknowledgement of God's authority. And believe, that Greek word is pestusius. It implies trust and certainty. Trust and certainty. So, so it is confess that, that means that it's leading me to a realization that I'm wrong. That my path, my life, me, my thoughts, my design, me being the Lord of my own life is wrong. That he's the king. And the thing about kings is they don't make suggestions. Because it's the king. 
And so, so when I acknowledge that he's the king, I'm acknowledging that he's right, and therefore simultaneously, I'm acknowledging that I'm wrong. I'm the problem, not him. And believe implies trust and certainty. Um, how do I know that I really believe? How do I know that there's really a trust and a certainty? Because real belief, real conviction always leads to action. I, I've said this a lot of times. It's been said by other preachers here. Um, you, only, you and I only believe the parts of the Bible that we live. If you tell me you believe something in the Bible, but your, your life never reflects that, you don't really believe it. It's lip service. Belief always leads to action. It always does. It, what's implied here, this verse is not translated this way, but it's implied, is that it would say this. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord. At, 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 the, at the fundamental center of salvation is what I'm confessing is not that he's just the son of God, it's that he's my king. He has authority over my life. And I'm believing that and I'm saying it out loud and then my life will follow a pattern that reflects this certainty in my life. And if, it, if my life doesn't change at all, then I don't really believe that he's my Lord. Because if he's my Lord, it's his decisions, not mine. It's his rules, not mine. It's his standards, not mine. It's his righteousness, because it's certainly not mine. So I admit that he has authority over me. My, I'm admitting my voluntary submission to him. Because what are the demons not doing when they, when they confess that he's Lord? They're going, I know you're the son of God. But I don't want to give you an authority. I know that you're the Lord, but I don't want to listen to you. I know that you're the Lord, but I'm not going to bend the knee until you make me. That's not a confession. That's an admittance, not a confession. So by doing so, by, 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 by that confession that Jesus Christ is my Lord, I'm saying my way of living is wrong. Your way is right. And I have a desire to live like you even if I feel like I don't have the power to do it. The, the two chapters leading up to Romans 10, 9 is, is Paul essentially making a theological argument that the law that God gave the Jews was there so that when they tried to do it, they would be able to see that they could never actually live in a way that was fully holy because none of us could actually keep up with the standard of the law, but that if you would put a faith in the power of Jesus Christ, that moving forward, you actually would be able to live in a, in a, in a righteous manner. You'd actually be able to live empowered by the Holy Spirit in such a way that you could not just fulfill the law, but you could actually live beyond the mere limits of the law because that's what Christ's righteousness has done. And it should highlight the difference between trying to live a legalistic lifestyle and living a life empowered by the Holy Spirit. So confess and believe is this idea that not only did Jesus save me, not only is he the king, not only is it his righteousness, but there will be an empowerment in his life and in my life because of it that I'll actually be able to live a righteous life. His power to save, his power to redeem us and change us, his power to free us, that his promises are true. It's a belief in those things. Now, if you believe those things, your life changes. It changes. And there are two stories in Jesus' time during his, his, his work that show us the difference between, there's, there's two stories, they start relatively similar. There's a man who believes that Jesus is either something great, some sort of prophet, teacher, son of God. They're both wealthy, and Jesus offers both salvation. No, even the fact that they're willing to say out loud that they believe him, even the, the reason, even that they will come and talk to him, even they have this belief. Only one belief is real because only one belief leads to an action change. And I'll read you both stories. Here's the first one, Mark 10, 17 through 22. And as he, this is Jesus, as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Does that sound like a familiar question? What must I do to be saved? It's the title of the sermon. What must I do to be saved? 
Wealthy man runs up to Jesus. He's, he's acknowledging that Jesus would know the answer. So, so he's acknowledging that Jesus has authority. Is he saved? I don't know. Let's see. And Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So what is Jesus saying? Why do you call me good? I'm only actually good if I'm God. You catch that, right? Jesus is trying to communicate to him, I'm God or else I'm not good. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. What's Jesus reading him? The Ten Commandments. Jesus is reading him the law. What are the two chapters before Romans 10? It's all about the law. Listen, if you just follow the law, you can be righteous, but no one can follow the law. And Jesus is trying to highlight that for him. Listen, you know what you got to do. You got to follow the law perfectly. You can never make a mistake. And anyone that can see the problem, anyone that can admit the problem is going to answer this question and go, man, I'm trying, (laughs) but I fall short. That's not what he says. What does he say? Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. Yep, I'm perfect. And yet there's a problem. Why why would he be asking Jesus if there wasn't a problem? And Jesus, looking at him, what does it say? What does it say? He loved him, therefore he told him the truth. He loved him, therefore he didn't leave him in his own self-deception. He loved him, he didn't leave him in the mire, in the mud of self-righteousness. He loved him enough to tell him the truth. If you love someone, you tell them the truth. I'm saying you do it gently, you do it carefully, you do it lovingly, but if you love them, you tell them the truth. If you won't tell them the truth, you don't love them. Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Did you really believe Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life? No, because if you believed it, his actions would have followed the certainty of the belief. It's not enough to say it out loud. It's not enough to intellectually know that Jesus is a good person, that Jesus is the son of God, that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. There has to be a certainty that his way is the way. Let's look at the second story. Luke 19, one through 10, another rich man. I love talking about rich guys because you guys are rich, even though you don't think you're rich. No one here thinks they're rich, but they're all rich. Say, I'm rich. Say, you're rich. Yes, you are. Luke 19, 1 through 10. He entered Jericho. So Jesus again. And he was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Everybody knows about Zacchaeus, right? We were all in Sunday school. He's a wee little man and a wee little man. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Pastor jokes. He was a chief tax collector. And he was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and he climbed up in a sycamore tree to see. For he was about to pass that way. So we have two rich men. Both of them come to Jesus. One of them is renowned. One of them is well liked. One of them has fame and notoriety. One of them people look at and go, man, that's a great guy. That's a rich young ruler. The other wealthy man is despised. He is an outcast and people hate him. He's just not a tax collector. That would be bad enough. He's the chief tax collector. That's worse. And don't get me started on short guys. Mm. (laughs) Every time I see Zacchaeus because he's a wee little man, I think he's a Jewish leprechaun. (laughs) Anyways, okay. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up. And he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Listen, don't don't miss this. 
Uh, there's not some, some specific amount of money or possessions that you have to give away. And you know, if you give away enough of your stuff, then you're saved. That's not it. Here's what's it. Zacchaeus had such a certainty of belief that Jesus Christ was the son of God. No one had to tell him his life had to change. He willingly gave away his wealth to be with Jesus. But the rich young ruler who comes asking, what must I do to be saved? There's no life change. There's no reason to make a decision based on a conviction because there's no conviction. And that's the difference. It's not enough to give the gospel lip service if it's not followed with actual change in our life. When I was uh, really young, I mean, I, I came to an intellectual understanding that Jesus was clearly the son of God, that Jesus was clearly resurrected, that, that, that God was good. I came to all of those realizations at a very, very young age in church. I didn't really have a choice. My dad was a pastor. His dad was a pastor. My mom's dad was a pastor. You see a theme here? So it wasn't hard to, to see the evidence and to go, well, yeah, he, he, that, that's the son of God. However, w- what did not follow for me at that young age, at three, four years old, was a conviction that I would actually act upon in which I would believe that only God's way is the right way and my own way would never be sufficient. That didn't happen until I was about 22 years old. And in that time frame, in that roughly 19 years, I spent a great deal of time running as far as I could from God, knowing that my, believing that my own effort, my own righteousness, my own uh, hard work, my own competencies, my own talents would be enough only for God to just chase me and chase me. And man, I keep telling you this. When you run from God, he has long legs. He just chases you down. He chases you down. And it is in his goodness that he chases you down because if he weren't a good God, he wouldn't chase me. He'd just let me run away. But he wouldn't. No matter where I ran, what city I got to, what people I I, I went to, they chased me down with the gospel. He was relentless with me because he was a good God. And I was not turned toward God. I was not a friend of God. I was an enemy of God. And he was chasing me anyways because he's good. And, and, And the point of actual salvation came at the point where I finally, in my heart and from my mouth, began to come to the saving faith of God's way and authority and plan and kingdom is the only way. And I submit to it. And that idea of submission, of voluntary submission, is what is implied and is so pertinent in the idea of confess and belief. We believe, it in with our, we believe it in our heart, and what we believe in our heart outpours through our mouth. So what does this mean for you and I? What does it mean for you and I? What do we do with this? Now, here's the first thing. Here's my question for you. Are you saved? Are you saved? How do you know if you're saved? What must I do to be saved? Have you acknowledged Jesus lordship in your life. That means not that you're a God-fearing man. It means that you're actually a God-fearing man or woman. It means that rightly you look at your own life and know it will never be sufficient without Christ. That means whatever Christ wants, whatever he desires, whatever he calls good is good. And when I have a disagreement between how I feel and what God says is good, God's right and I'm wrong. And that means submission on my part because kings don't make suggestions. Is he your Lord? That's my question for you. Not is he the Lord, is he your Lord? Do you believe in your heart and with your mouth that he is your Lord? Do you believe he's your king? That it's his way, his plan, his rules, his power, his kingdom, his way. Because if not, you're not saved. At best, at best, we've, we've made it past the Pharisees of not believing that he is the son of God, and we've made it to demon level faith. 
I believe he's God, just not mine. How many people in American evangelical churches would admit that he's the son of God, but he's not really convictionally their Lord. And we have millions of people in the United States and other places that because of cultural Christianity are simply practicing a demon level of faith and don't know him as their Lord. That should scare you. It scares me. It scares me all the time. That I would talk to a friend or a loved one or someone I care deeply about and they don't know him as their Lord. He's just some sort of creation of their own where they've created their own subjective morals. Secondly, have you spoken it out loud? Have you declared, have you actually confessed with your mouth, Jesus is my Lord? Has your life begun to change as a result of that belief and that confession. Because what is implied here, and what we'll begin to see all throughout the New Testament, all throughout people that turn to faith in Jesus Christ, is that their life begins to manifest itself into this action where your, your life now is being lived according to the king and not according to yourself. Because without that actual change, repentance wasn't real. We didn't believe in the first place. We we're giving him lip service. We only believe the parts of the Bible that we live out. The gap between when I acknowledged that Jesus was good and I actually believed and acknowledged that he was Lord of my life was substantial. It was almost two decades. And for many of you, I believe that intellectually you know Jesus is Lord, but convictionally you've yet to surrender your life to him and call him your Lord. And listen to me, there'll be millions of people, I believe, millions of people over the course of the last few hundred years because of American evangelicalism that will have come to work days at church, they will have given in the offering, they will have sung songs and thrown their hands up in the air, they will have attended Bible studies, and they will have never known him as their Lord. And then someday they'll stand before him and he will say, I never knew you. Depart from me. That's God-fearing. A, a, a real reverent fear of God. Do you know him? Do you know him? And if you have not done that, if you have not acknowledged with your lips that he is your king, that he is your ruler, that he is the only way you've not done that, I want to invite you to do that today. The Bible is going to say that when you do that, number one, all of the hosts in heaven celebrate that someone has come to the king, that he has saved someone else. Secondly, they say that when you do that, the very next act that you should do is that you should go Facebook official with Jesus. Okay, it doesn't actually sound like that. <laughs> that you should go and publicly declare this by baptism and that we take you and we dunk you in water as a symbol that you now have been restored to a new life, that you were dead bones that have been resurrected, that he has taken a heart of stone and he's putting a heart of flesh inside of you. And then all of a sudden you have a new king, a new life, a new future, new promises, a new eternity, a new power, a new spirit. So if you've never done that, don't sit as a bag of dead bones in these pews for the next few years, wasting your time. Surrender your life, declare it with your mouth, and move forward in a new life with a new king. For those of you that know him, you've, you've, you, you know him, you have a relationship with Jesus, man. He has saved you. You could point to it. You can see the evidence in your life. There's, there's absolutely no debate that God has saved you, changed you, began to transform you. I would just ask you this. As we look at Asbury in Kentucky, uh, what began to happen, if you watch the 47-minute sermon that, that started this whole thing, it's a, it's a very unremarkable sermon. So what happened? Historically, every time we've seen a revival, there are some people that respond to God by, by, by finally publicly confessing 
a sin in, in, or an area of their life that they have not allowed God to be the ruler of. They've not allowed God to have authority of. And so what they've done is they've held that back from him and they've hidden it and, they, and, they've, and they've gone around it. It's like the, the dirty closet in your house. Whenever guests are going to come over, you just pile all the bad stuff in there and ask them not to open that door. And so as Christians, um, we're like, Lord, you can be Lord of my life except this area. God, you're totally Lord of my life except when it comes to relationships. God, you're totally Lord of my life except when it comes to sexual desire. God, you're absolutely the total Lord of my life except for my finances. God, you're, 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 you're it, man. You're God. I totally love you except when it comes to self-reliance. And there's this point where revival starts where, where finally, we see this in Acts 19, where, where it's just, it's too much. I can't hide that sin. I can't hide that lack of dependence on God. I can't hide that area where I'm in rebellion to God any longer. It's not worth wearing that weight because Jesus' yoke is supposed to be light. It's not supposed to be a burden. I'm supposed to be able to walk in freedom. And so I'm tired of walking with that and I want to live in freedom. And so believers, not non-Christians, believers take that sin and they pull it out of the darkness and they put it in the light and they confess of it so they can move forward. What are you holding back from God? What are you arguing with him about in your head? What are you hiding from other people that you have to surrender? Because kings don't make suggestions because they're the king. So if you're already a believer here today, as our prayer team is up here, we want to pray for you. If you're um, sick, if you have health concerns, we want to pray over you because the Bible tells us to. If you need to confess something and we want you to come to the altar, you can confess it to God. You can grab somebody up here and you can confess things to them. I sat in front of a group of people a couple weeks ago and I said, if, if you were so compelled, if I asked you to, could you confess the worst thing that you've ever done and the worst thing that you've ever thought to the people at the table? And you should have seen some people like, oh. If you need to confess, you, the altar is open. But here's what I will tell you. You can, in your own pride, fight with God as much as you want. But let me just tell you the, the, the fundamental truth of all of the gospel. He's the king. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your effort fighting him. Surrender it to God and move forward in freedom. You move as the Lord leads you. I'm going to pray over you. Our uh, elders of prayer team are going to be up here. We're going to sing a song, and we give you an opportunity to respond as the Lord moves in your life. Let me pray for you, Father. We thank you that you loved us while we were your enemies, God. There are people watching this uh, online, and, and there are people here right now, and there are people that will watch this later that are fighting you. God, they, they, they have created a God in their own mind that is not you, God. And I ask that you cut them to the heart, God, that you convict them, that you regenerate their heart, that you pursue them, that you woo them, God. You awaken them and reveal your spirit and your power to them, God, and they will surrender their life to you that they would believe in their hearts, that they would publicly confess your lordship of their life, God, and they would move forward in freedom, God. And I pray for those that know you here, that are struggling in an area they just can't seem to give over to you, God, an addiction, a, 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 a sin, just a hidden thing that they, they're just fighting with you on, God. And it's, it's been a battle, and they are tired. God, I ask you would compel them to give that over to you, God, to take that burden that they are wearisome from, and they would hand it to you, God, and they would walk forward in the freedom that is your kingship and your lordship in their life. God, we pray for revival, not, not in Asbury, not in some foreign place. God, we pray for revival here in our cul-de-sacs, in our workplaces, in the gym, in the grocery store, in the restaurant. God, we pray for it in our church that men and women would give all of their life over to you, God, and they would stop trying to keep their hands on parts of their life to control. God, I thank you that you, you didn't just let me go in rebellion. You didn't just say, well, man, that guy Daniel's lost too bad. That you chased me down while I was your enemy, God. You were relentless pursuing me and that you loved me and that you put up with me. God, I thank you so much for your son and your patience and your goodness, God. Would you move in our lives and bring us even closer to you? In Jesus' name, amen. You move as the Lord leads you and we sing.
What a great day in the Lord's house. An amazing message. <clears throat> Earlier this, this week, I was able to uh, go to the Bakersfield Pregnancy Center's uh, banquet. Um, we had four tables there as a church, and it was just a great time to uh, kind of visit with one of our mission partners and to see the work that they're doing. And they're doing amazing work there in caring for people. Um, just really eye-opening to the things that they're doing. And I'm just so thankful that we're able to partner with them as a church. Um, one of the things that really caught my attention, and I wrote it down, I didn't write down a lot of stuff because I was just kind of, you know, having a good evening. But what they said was 49% of all women who go through with an abortion that come back to church and they hear the pastor preach on forgiveness, believe that they're not talking about them because they can't be forgiven. And um, as, a, as a gospel believing church, like that just breaks my heart um, that people can believe that what they did can't be forgiven. And I, I just want to encourage you guys as a church. Like, I believe that we are so encouraging. And one of the things about coming to church isn't just worshiping or consuming or, you know, hearing a great sermon, but it's the encouragement that we give and get when we come to church. And I just want to encourage you guys, when you guys come in, you guys do a wonderful job of this, but I want to encourage you to keep doing it. As you come to church each and every week, make sure you're finding people and you're encouraging them, encouraging them that God loves them, that God forgives them, that we serve an amazing God. I just want to continue to encourage you guys to do that. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna pray over our, our offering, but just as a reminder of, the Bakersfield Pregnancy Center or Flood Ministries. Last week we had a, a person from Flood Ministries come to church and give their life to Christ because one of the guys that works at Flood Ministries goes to our church and invited them to church. We, we are doing work, God is doing work in the community around us. And we have these great mission partners that we're able to partner with because you guys give. 15% of all of what we give as a church um, Goes, it goes back to our mission partners around the world, including Bakersfield. And we couldn't do that without you guys. So thank you for consistently giving, for consistently sacrificing uh, the resources that God's given you guys. I greatly appreciate that. And our mission partners appreciate that. Um, before we go, I just want to encourage you guys to know that your church is praying for you throughout the week. We hope that you're praying for the other people in our church too to be brave, to be strong, to uh, encourage their friends and families and to be a great example of what Christ has done in our lives. So let me say a prayer and then you guys are dismissed. Remember, you can give your offering in the offering boxes. You can put your cards in the offering boxes. Father God, Lord, thank you for this day. God, thank you for this opportunity to worship to you today. God, thank you for the opportunity to encourage the church body today. God, thank you for your message, God, and for the uh, change that it's going to do in our hearts, God. Lord, um, we ask you to, to be with the church this week as we go out, God, to shine your face upon them, God, to be gracious to them. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys are dismissed. <laughs>